Next up is assistant to the president and director of the Domestic Policy Council from the White House, Joe Grogan. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me here. I especially want to thank all the entrepreneurs and innovators who are attending because I recognize all that you bring to health care. And I recognize all that you do for American patients as well. I want to talk for a few moments about the larger health care policy context that we face as a country. It's often easy when you stare at one business opportunity or one new payment rule, initiative, or regulatory action to forget that government health care actions are often driven by larger philosophical forces. They're driven by a vision <clears throat> for health care that frequently stems from an ideological point of view. And people are sometimes confused about what the Trump administration's view is on health care. What is our ideology? And in fact, we're a profoundly non-ideological administration focused solely on solving problems. <clears throat> it's often difficult to cut through this because the DC media is focused on the scandal of the day, petty disputes, and the uh, politics around the Affordable Care Act. In fact, due to the time change this morning, I was woken up by a DC reporter who called me to ask me the extremely important question of whether or not I was with the president last night at some fundraiser when he supposedly made a joke about Jeff Sessions. And I said, no, I'm in Vegas, and I really don't care one way or the other. But we do face stark policy choices, and we stake a, a stark choice in which direction we will head as a country right now. It's important to understand that we got here at this moment in time, driven in large part by ideolo ideology. Obamacare's big ideas were that central planning would work and that Washington, D.C. could dictate to the American people and American innovators how healthcare should function. And all they were focused on for eight years was making sure that the ACA created the illusion of success. If you wanted to have a meeting on high drug prices or a public health problem that you wanted solved, it was often difficult, if not impossible, to get a meeting in the, in, with the Obama administration senior leadership. They wanted to make sure the website worked. They wanted the enrollment numbers up. If you want to talk about innovation in medical devices, <clears throat> HIV transmission, how to get drug prices down, they weren't interested. The ACA sucked all the oxygen out of the room. And during that time, a number of crises were allowed not just to fester, but to explode, including opioid crisis, e-cigarettes. The Washington Post, the New York Times have just written exposés about how these problems were not just allowed to grow in magnitude, but go from zero to 60 in the time that the Obama administration was totally focused just on the ACA. And it's important to remember that while the ACA is important. It's really just a small slice of health care in this country. If you look at this, the individual market, this now is about 13 million people. The uninsured here, 30 million. And even Democrats running for president today and many in, in the Senate recognize that the ACA is a failure. If we don't recognize why it failed, We'll make even bigger ones. Obamacare had several big ideas, including digitizing the healthcare system and universal comprehensive health insurance that was dictated as one size fits all. It had faith in government fiats and faith in central planning. During the Bush administration, a flirtation began with electronic health records. I gotta find the right slide here. And that flirtation grew into a larger, grew into a larger uh, love affair during the Obama administration. Barack Obama said to improve the quality of our health care while lowering costs, we, the government, will make the immediate investments necessary to ensure that within five years, all of America's medical records are computerized. 
This will cut waste, eliminate red tape, and reduce the need to repeat expensive medical tests. It will save lives by reducing the deadly but preventable medical errors that pervade our healthcare system. But spending was not contained as promised. We've seen healthcare spending per capita rise from about 8,000 in 2009 to over 11,000 now, a 40% increase that far exceeds the broader inflation measures. The stimulus package spent $36 billion to subsidize electronic health records for, for providers, but failed to encourage industry to develop innovative ways to prevent medical errors and fraud. In a world where providers buy products with a government subsidy, they don't care about containing costs of performance. And most importantly, patients were forgotten. How many of you have been in the emergency room with a family member recently? Have you watched how much time is spent between the doctor and the patient with actual eye contact, with the nurse and the patient in actual eye contact, as, a spoke, as opposed to time staring at a tablet or a computer? We can't forget that these are human beings we're dealing with. And now we're now have gotten to a situation where we're rewarding doctors and nurses for data entry and not for connecting with human beings and making sure they get better. And while almost all hospitals today have electronic health records, we've not seen the improved outcomes that were promised. In fact, an investigative report by Kaiser Health News found thousands of reports of patient fatalities and injuries tied to software glitches in many of these systems. Where did they go wrong? Emergency room doctors make 4,000 computer clicks during a single shift. The Pew Charitable Trust reports that patient matching for records was only accurate 50% of the time at some institutions. Prescriptions lack proper start and stop dates, introducing the opportunity for over-medication. And rather than looking to markets and states to respond to patient needs and the committed doctors who serve them to identify successful concept, concepts that can transform our healthcare system from the ground up, top-down policymakers decided where the market should move. But if we were focused on from the ground up, we would have not lost sight of the patients in the first place. And now the Trump administration is working to clean up this mess by advancing a rule to make electronic health systems interoperable, improve patient record keeping, reduce duplication, and reduce administrative burdens to get doctors and nurses focused on patients again. These new proposals will foster a healthcare marketplace where patients are in charge and can act on their own health information. Another idea in, the Obama, uh, in Obamacare was the, affordable, were the accountable care organizations. Obamacare gave us flawed electronic health record schemes, and the accountable care organizations, again, were put in place with only upside risk because we wanted to create the illusion that numerous doctors were enrolling in them and there was no downside risk contemplated for as long as six years. ACOs were supposed to have provider groups taking responsibility for the cost and quality of patient care while earning a portion of the savings they generate in the process. But the very term accountable requires you to contemplate downside risk. And we only had upside for accountable care organizations when the Trump administration came to town. We've taken action to balance encouraging participation in the ACO program with promoting better value, ultimately protecting taxpayers and patients. And we need to move beyond programs with weak incentives that do not deliver value. We finalized Pathways to Success, a role to strengthen incentives by providing higher shared savings rates and greater program flexibility. And we're working to, to achieve program-wide savings in ACOs, which was not achieved for the years when the ACOs were first set up during the Obama administration. Remember, they were set up to achieve program-wide savings and better outcomes they achieved neither. They may still fail. Let's not kid ourselves. ACOs may not work, but we're at least driving groups quicker into taking downside risks. We in the, in the Trump administration are looking for the people in this room to solve the problems that will deliver better care and not dictate them from the, from the uh, top down. 
The central conceits of Obamacare are one, you can keep your doctor, and two, everyone will be covered. Obamacare mandated, mandated coverage, expanded Medicaid, and created the exchanges. And the exchanges offer few bureaucratically approved choices that many Americans do not want. There are 30 million uninsured in the United States today. Many of those are eligible for Medicaid and they simply choose not to sign up. There are roughly 13 million in the individual market. There were 10 at the beginning uh, of the ACA's implementation. And when the regulations were set up, they severely upset the individual market. Many people did lose their doctor. Premiums on healthcare.gov more than doubled by 2017 compared to the year prior to implementation. And enrollment among people who didn't receive premium subsidies declined in 2015 and 2016. Right now, unless you are almost fully subsidized or fully subsidized or have a pre-existing condition, you are not buying an Obamacare plan. And these premium increases all, occur, all occurred before the Trump administration eliminated the individual mandate tax penalty in tax, in tax reform, which our critics said would absolutely destroy the ACA. It would, when we eliminated cost sharing reductions, payments to insurance, or the expansion of association health plans, health reimbursement accounts, or short-term plans. In fact, President Trump issued an order on his first day in office to minimize the economic burden of Obamacare and gave states flexibility to address market problems. We have not only expanded choice for individuals, but we've expanded options for states through reinsurance waivers, which have driven premiums down significantly. In Colorado, a state with a Democratic governor, premiums are down over 20% because of, of a waiver we gave them. And in the face of these efforts, our detractors have accused us of sabotage. Sabotage is an epithet. It's an epithet that central planners always use when confronted with people choosing freedom. Who is the ideologue when today in the United States Senate, Senator Schumer is pushing a bill to overturn our 1332 flexibilities, which eight out of 13 governors who have chosen are Democrats. We are being confronted with governors, Republican and Democrat, who are begging us for help, for more flexibility. When we give it to them, we're being accused of sabotage. But central planning does not work. It doesn't work here in the United States. It doesn't work in Venezuela, and it, do, it doesn't work for states who are demanding flexibility to get better health care for their citizens. The government now spends $50 billion a year on subsidies in the Obamacare exchanges. We are now at roughly, as I said before, 13.8 million people in the individual market less than half of the number that was projected by the Congressional Budget Office. Economists estimate that Medicaid recipients only value their health care benefits at less than 50 cents per dollar spent by the government. So it is no surprise that eligible people, eligible people are not signing up. Again, we are focused on actual health, not on systems. We are not focused on top-down policy. Much of the opioid crisis is occurring in states that expanded Medicaid, which suggests that health insurance is not the only important determinant of health. And there is now bipartisan consensus that we need to move beyond the ACA. If we approach, the, if we approach problems from a non-ideological perspective, we can find real solutions for the American people. And where are the Democrats now? Pushing more central planning. Medicare for all, single payer, Medicare buy-in. They're returning to the mothership of central planning. And they cannot accept that no one is smart enough to design a health care system for all Americans. And this may all be theoretical unless you're actually trying to solve real problems because there will not be enough money to fund the innovation that the American people are going to need in the decades ahead if we have single payer in the United States. The Sanders plan alone will cost $17,000 per household and people will pay more to wait longer for worse care. 
Medicare for all, for all will never allow seniors to get the same level of coverage that they get now. Medicare for all will end up being Medicare for none. And the pet Medicare buy-in option will necessitate heavy subsidies for people that don't really need them. Heavy subsidies in Medicare are supposed to be there for seniors who can't buy health insurance in the first place. Medicare was created to correct for a market failure. We recognize that there are market failures. The pre-existing conditions, provisions of uh, uh, protections of Obamacare did address a market failure. And we recognize that people with pre-existing conditions need to be covered. The president campaigned on it. He said repeatedly they need to be covered. <clears throat> the question is how to do that. But don't be fooled by public options. Public options will allow the government to control the use of their money, of, the, of American people's money, and people who want to choose to get out of government plans will not be allowed to. In fact, many members of Congress who are supposed to be buying Obamacare plans don't. They get on their spouse's private plans, including some of the members of Congress you'll hear from during this, con uh, during this conference. So again, we are not in the sabotage business, we're in the freedom business. This guy right here, taking a sledgehammer to the Berlin Wall, is not a saboteur, and he's not an ideologue. Our guiding vision of healthcare entails healthcare choice and competition, improved tr price and, qu and quality transparency, access to more affordable health insurance, lower prescription drug prices and out-of-pocket costs, and drug prices for the first time in 50 years have declined as a measure of inflation year over year. The, the president's focus on drug prices has interjected more vigorous competition and negotiation between payers and manufacturers, leading to actual price deflation. And we're tackling problems that other administrations didn't tackle. In fact, we have no limits on the types of uh, patient advocacy groups or commercial actors or companies that will come in and ask for meetings. If you have a problem, we want to hear it and we want to hear how to solve it. We can't always guarantee success, but we want to get our arms around tackling problems. This is just a few of the things that we've done since we've been, been in off. Zeroing out the individual mandate pay, uh, penalty, focusing the opioid crisis. Opioid overdose deaths are down for the first time in decades. Lowering prescription drug price and out-of-pocket costs. Alzheimer's research. The president is focused on eliminating HIV transmission in the next 10 years. Because it's within our scientific possibility, but we simply don't have the will to focus on it. You just heard from Eric Hargan, the Deputy Secretary of HHS, who led, who's leading the effort on the anti-kickback rule and Stark statutes. It's a two-year project. Over two years, they've been working on this to allow greater innovations in value-based care, device uh, reimbursement, and ultimately uh, a revolution in how we get uh, creative funding solutions for payers, plans, and, um, and for people marketing new products. We're reducing paperwork. And we are saving doctors and nurses an estimated 40 million hours through 2021 by reducing onerous regu regulations. We'll be moving aggressively to increase price transparency in the next few, few weeks. And we're working with Congress on ending surprise medical billing. In moving on price tra pricing transparency, we will get sued. And we are constantly criticized, oh, more transparency will, in, will increase prices and increase collusion. But we've been hearing that for decades and prices continue to go up. It's impossible to believe that allowing people to have more visibility in how they spend uh, their healthcare dollars will actually drive prices up. We've been promoting healthcare choice and competition. We signed the Veterans Administration's Mission Act to allow veterans to get private sector options so they aren't only trapped in the VA system. executive orders on price and quality transparency, you, the kidney health initiative, 
This was a program that hasn't been touched since the Nixon administration. Increasing the supply of organs that are available for transmission, increasing home health dialysis, all things that the kidney health community were begging for. It took over 18 months of work to get it done. Modernizing influenza vaccines so we go beyond egg-based solutions to more modern ways of developing flu vaccines, including a universal vaccine and refocusing our efforts on protecting and improving Medicare for the program it was designed to protect in the first place. And this is being done at a time when we're seeing the lowest Medicare Advantage rates in, in 13 years. And back to drug pricing for a second, Medicare Part D rates are lower than they've been in seven years. The Trump administration is committed to ensuring the world's best health care for all Americans. That means confronting challenges that other administrations, Democrat and Republican, have not confronted before. It means being driven by data. We're protecting vulnerable patients, making health care more affordable, giving Americans more options and control, and delivering the high quality care Americans deserve. This isn't easy. But one of the great privileges of working for a president who didn't spend 40 years in politics is that all he's looking to do is solve problems that other administrations didn't confront. You give him a problem, he says, let's solve it. And he's not interested in, in pulling a solution off the shelf that a Republican administration developed 30 years ago and never revisited. He's not interested in, in just pursuing a campaign slogan. We're building a healthcare system that delivers more options, better health, longer lives, at lower cost. And as we move into a hyper-politicized atmos atmosphere, and we'll be hit with a number of criticisms of our healthcare achievements, it's important to remember that if we were to focus on a bipartisan basis, Democratic and Republican, from non-ideological basis, and just focus on results, we could take care of people with pre-existing conditions. We could restore the health insurance markets. We could allow for people in the private sector to innovate and create new solutions and deliver be better value for American patients. We are the leader in healthcare innovation and we need to keep it that way. If we put faith in Washington DC politicians and bureaucrats to dictate to the American people the solutions of what's right for them, and to pick and choose what technologies are sufficient to be reimbursed. If we say, look, we know better than the private sector. We know better than physicians. We're gonna end up in a terrible place. There's no greater example of the failures of central planning in my own mind than the electronic health records example. Because again, it began, the flirtation began during the Bush administration and it went into overdrive during the Obama administration. And it was all premised around systems, and we forgot about the patients that were all supposed to be here trying to, to solve and help in the first place. I want to thank you. Good luck in improving America's health care.